Hi, my name is Fats Timbo and this is the Living Fearlessly podcast, all about pursuing your dreams and overcoming your fears. Each week, I'm going to have an amazing guest where we talk about how they overcome their fears, the fears they are yet to face and the tools that help them do so. So it's a chance to get to know me and the guest. We're going to get personal. So let's get started. There is nothing to fear. Hi guys, welcome to the Living Fearlessly podcast with me, Fats Timbo, and it's inspired by my book, Main Character Energy, 10 Commandments to Living Life Fearlessly, and I have a very special guest today. He is an MMA fighter who fights in the UFC, and his name is Nathaniel Wood. (laughs) How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for the good introduction. I try. I try my best, (laughs) you know. It's, it's not easy giving introductions because I always ask beforehand, like, how do you want me to introduce you? Because I don't want to get wrong and I want to have, I want to give you the best introduction ever. So, so we're going to start off with the quick fire questions. By the way, if you see my stain, don't mind it. I know I have a stain. Thank you. Okay. How do you feel about quick fire? You fasten your feet? Um, oh, usually if I'm if it's about MMA, yes, but today you might catch me off guard. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're you gonna might just delve need to deeper. Like we're gonna talk about MMA. We're gonna talk about your personal life. We're yep. gonna talk about every everything and anything, maybe. <laughs> but we're gonna talk okay. about a lot of stuff. So the first question is, what was your greatest fear as a child? <sighs> Greatest fear as a child, right. So, uh, I was about to say you might laugh at this one, but you probably won't laugh. So, I suffer with OCD, right? And I've realised that I've had that since I was a child. Now, one of my greatest fears growing up, which I obsessed over and had to ask my mum every single day, is will I go to hell? Will I go to hell? Will I go to hell for this? Will I go to hell for that? Literally anything, you name it, I would ask my mum, would I go to hell? So, How young were you? Honestly, it breaks my heart to think about it, but I probably six, seven. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like, you know, anything I kind of did, if I swore, you know, if I said a bad word, I'd be like, am I going to go to hell? My mum would go, no, you know, stop it. Don't be ridiculous. But I didn't know at the time if I'm dealing with anything. I just right. assumed this was, I'm scared of hell, but I obsessed over it. It's the anxiety I mean? as well. Yeah. And I honestly, you know, being a, I don't know, seven, eight year old kid, sitting there thinking I'm going to burn in hell for where yeah. did you learn about like heaven and hell like this is going off quick fire yeah, I'm getting, we're, getting we're in we're, we're deep going, we're that's in. it um, so you le- did you learn about heaven and hell in church or yeah I must have just I don't know I must have just seen something that scared me and uh yeah, I would just think that if I was ever a naughty kid, I wouldn't think, oh, I'm going to get in trouble with mum and dad or, right. you know, I'm going to get a detention at school or whatever. It would be like, oh, am I going to go to hell? And yeah, I just now now I've been diagnosed and di- diagnosed with it, sorry, I kind of know like, yeah, that was OCD. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm not like that now with, with hell. Um, but yeah, growing up, that was like my biggest fear. You know, I just kept thinking I'm going to go to hell. So, oh my god, um, let's let's go back to the f- uh, quick fire yeah. question. So, what is your greatest fear now? The greatest fear now, I would probably say, is loved ones dying, or dying myself to a certain extent. Very rational. Um, I have an obsession and OCD. I'd say over cancers. You know, I'm not scared if I go on my motorbike and mm. it's you know super dangerous. You could die on a motorbike. But as soon as people talk about cancers, you know that scares the hell out of me. So, yes, that's probably I'd say my biggest fear as of now. What is the most frightening thing you have ever done? I would say getting in the cage and having an MMA fight is probably your first ever one. Yeah, yeah, I'd probably say that. Well, I don't know. I wasn't that scared, but. Yeah, you know, I'd have probably said at the time that would have probably been the most scariest thing. Um, yeah, it must have been that. If you were afraid, who would you call? My dad. Dad's Love always that. got my back. We love dads. If you were afraid and you couldn't call anyone, what tricks would you use to stay cool? Count to ten and then count from ten backwards. That's a good way, you know, because yeah. it reduces your anxiety. I do it when I'm doing sprints. So really? if I'm on the treadmill, let's say I've got a minute, I count to 10, then 10 backwards, do that, five, that is a three good times way. to 20, you know, it's, then you're done. 
what would you say to someone who was about to have their first ever MMA fight? Enjoy it. Okay, enjoy it. Uh, me, I'm trying to picture myself maybe doing that stuff, and it's scary. <laughs> scary. Yeah. I guess it's like things like your podcast, right? You're probably nervous yes. starting it, doing it, but then you realize that you're going to enjoy it, but the, the nervousness, I guess, you have around it is going to ruin the enjoyment. Right, so, right. Similar sort of thing, I guess. What would you take for your life to feel complete? Uh, so I always have a vision in my head, right? And I'm sitting in my farm. Right. I haven't got a farm now. This is my farm in the, in the future with my, my wife, my kids playing. And then I've got a couple of dogs playing off in the, in the fields as well. You know, that's my kind of sit back, visualise. So you're um, family orientated. Yes. Yeah. In, in the kind of countryside, which growing up, I'd never want to live in the countryside. I couldn't think of anything worse. But now I'm like, I need some land, some dogs, and my kids playing. And I just think that that's like my heaven. Oh, that is beautiful, honestly. I think peaceful life, enjoying the people you love, mm -hmm. that's all you need. 100%. So we're going to move on to the commandments. Mm -hmm. I have 10 commandments in my book. These are things that I learned throughout my life mm -hmm. and things that beforehand I, I didn't know how to overcome. But through these commandments, I learned how to be the best that I can be. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read each one out to you and then ask you questions surrounding it. Okay. So the first one, commandment one. Be unexpected. Don't change yourself to fit the world's expectation. Change the world to make it expect you. So my question is, when have you defied people's expectations? In my career, I would say. Um, so when I first started mixed martial arts, and I remember this today, and I saw him not long ago, my boss at the time when I was on a building site told me, you know, be realistic. Like, you know, this MMA thing, you got to kind of, you know, forget about it, focus on your building work, get better, earn better money. Right. So when I officially, I guess, made it, you know, got to the UFC, started making a proper, proper bit of money out of it, that was my like, Yeah. you didn't expect that. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? Um, and he tries to text me to this day asking for tickets and stuff. So I'm like, see you later. Yeah, see ya. See ya. Oh, I know what you mean. Because people, oh my God, especially at the beginning, especially when I wanted to start modeling, mm. they were like, you modeling? There's not people like you modeling. Like, Be the first though, right? Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So I think growing up, People never expected me to do something like mm. this. Would you say the same for yourself? 100%. Really? If you, see, if you see me when I was in school, I had someone actually not long ago come up to me in, in the pub and he, what did he say? I think he said, you was a neek at school. And a neek at the time, you know, I know. Like, like a geek, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. And he went, yeah, it's weird because you was a neek at school. And I sort of remember thinking, well, this neek could beat you up right now if I wanted exactly. to. Exactly, so, knock you out. Yeah, and I, I was a very shy kid. Um, I wasn't like with my friends, you know, I wasn't a quiet kid, but I was very nervous. I was a mummy's boy growing up, you know, um, I've always stayed out of trouble. I'm not some, you know, Larry fighter that's kind of always looking for a fight on the street, anything like that. You know, I shy away from it. And I think now people see me and they're like, he's fighting in a cage against some of the best fighters on the planet. Is that the same boy at school? <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's, yeah, uh, it, is it is and it's, it is the same person. I just, I just love fighting. That is amazing. And um, I guess in school, how did it make you feel when, I don't know, like that person said you were a neek in school and for putting your head down in school and oh, I being... It. I love it. Yeah. So now I, if anything, that there's a game as well. I don't know if you know it. It's called RuneScape. I used to play yeah, it. So I, I used to play it. Then I heard that it came back out like the old school RuneScape and I was promoting it on my Instagram. I was showing people like, look, I'm a nerd. Do you know what I mean? I'm proud to be a nerd if you like. Um, so that people can relate to you as well. Yeah, like, like just because you play RuneScape or play so-and-so game doesn't mean mm. you can't fight or doesn't mean yeah. you can't be out there, you know. I think being real and being you is the most... Um, what, what, what was the word I would say? Um, I don't know what the word is, but it's like... I envy, I envy people that are purely themselves. Do you know what I mean? 
So you like, want to, you almost want to kind of being authentic. I think yeah. is such a boss move, and it's a skill as well because yeah. we're we're authentic when we're at home. Yeah, we're we're authentic when we're with our mum and dad. Yeah. But it's hard to be authentic when you're around people that you don't know because you want to put your best foot forward. I think when you see someone being themselves and not embarrassed, so, you know, like I talk about my OCD, but for years I was embarrassed to talk about it. But now I don't care, you know? It's like if someone's laughed at me or whatever, I'd think, you know, I'm in the UFC, which is pretty, like, pretty cool for me. Um, You know, I have a decent bit of money in my bank. Okay, cool. That's a a good one. Yes. I have a cool dog. Yes. I have a motorbike. I have two cool cars. Yeah, I'm like... So if you don't think much of me, cool. I would, cool. I'd rather not, not have you there, you know? Um, I'd rather have people around me that are there for me. Yes. Being, if it's a geek or whatever I am, then, you know, pretending to be someone and then having them fake people around me. Right. So, yeah. I think, I think, I I think, think that comes with age, right? It's ma- yeah. maturity, maybe. You mentioned there, like, people... I guess you having all of those things, you feel secure in yourself. Yeah. And I feel exactly the same way now. The other day I was on Piccadilly Circus Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, oh my God, what would my bullies think? But I don't care at the same time because I'm doing me. I'm happy. So I guess people never thought I'd be doing broadcasting and all this stuff. Did people Mm. think that you were would ever be a fighter? Did you ever think that you'd be a fighter? I don't think so. I kind of, because I've always loved play fighting when I was a kid. You know, I was always very, um, my mum would say boisterous with my cousins and that <laughs> sort of thing. So, you know, I've always liked the idea because to me, MMA, UFC is play fighting. It's a very, you know, aggressive form of play fighting. But, you know, there's a referee, there's medicals. It's a one-on-one fight. And, you know, it's not, I'm not I've never gone out and had fights on the street. You know, I'm not some football hooligan kind of rough and tough right. guy. But, I love martial arts. Um, so growing up, I've always been into martial arts. So if you had told me when I was younger, you would be a fighter. You know, I could, I'd say I could probably see it, but I just would never think it would actually have happened, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I've always been very athletic as well. So that's what martial arts is. You know, it's a sport. Um, so, yeah, it feels good now. And, you know, when I first started, the, the dream was make this my living. And that's what I'm doing now. So is there, has, has there been any breakthrough moments in your UFC career so my UFC debut and the reason being it's because of the money I got right. but it was basically when you I was earning nothing you know I was a cage as world champion and I was probably getting two thousand pound a fight you have three of them a year that's six grand a year it's not a wage right but I'm doing it full time right. so I'm just literally living on six grand for the year um, and that was good. I didn't time. know that, and I'm sure a lot of people don't no, know that. So I would make a bit of money on tickets, because I'd sell tickets if it's London, a lot of people come and support me. Um, but yeah, you know, you're literally having to kind of scrimp and save everything you've got to make this work. When I got to the UFC, my first fight, it was $10,000 to fight 10 if you win. But then you got minus the dollars to pounds, which I think at the time, let's say, was £8,000. Right. And then 20% to your manager and tax... So I was sitting there thinking before my fight, if I lose this fight, I'm walking away with like four grand. Again, I'm on the biggest platform and this is nothing, right? That that's If I had that three times a year, it was 12 grand a year to be on the, the biggest show. But I got the win and I got yes. the UFC bonus, which was 50,000. So literally I saw in my bank. 50K? Yeah, after all the taxes and your manager's car, et cetera, I had about 38 grand. And before that, that, I've never had more than 200 quid in my bank. So I remember looking at it going... We've made it. We're going shopping. Yeah, yes. that was my kind of. All right, this is this is it now. I've kind of got to the big leagues, and you know that was only the starting pace. So obviously, every fight it goes up, and you know I'm on a new contract now. But yeah, that was that moment where I was like, yeah, it was all yes. worth it. Yes, that was your breakthrough moment. Yeah, I love that. We are going to move on to commandment two. Let love be your superpower take care of those who care about you and they will help you fly who are the people that made you fearless my parents definitely you know I'm very fortunate to have great parents in my life and 
yeah, now that I'm older and I kind of see how other friends have relationships with their parents, I've realised that I'm blessed. You know, I'm so yes. blessed to have my mum and dad. And yeah, you know, as soon as I told my mum and dad, you know, I want to be an MMA fighter, they supported me every step of the way. They've never once kind of gone, you know, maybe it's time to go and get a job. You know, they've always told me, chase your dreams, be happy. Yes. And, you know, they've always had my back. So, you know, how can I, uh, you know, how can I be in fear when I've got my parents there? I love that. I completely relate because my parents have always been there for me. Obviously, um, I've mentioned a lot of the time that they are both average height mm -hmm. and they randomly had a child with dwarfism. They didn't know how to combat that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I think through their love and guidance and always supporting me, it helped me fly. And I feel like... <clears throat> without them i don't i don't know if, no, yeah. <laughs> i don't know if i'll be able to do it so um who else supported you in your mma journey i'm guessing coaches um coaches fighters giving you advice yeah so a guy i met but this was probably six years into my career uh, was brad pickett and he was ufc fighter at the time and he's now my coach and he's been my coach since I met and he's been a godsend. You know, he's like a kind of like a father figure, but obviously I do have my dad still, but yeah. you know, he's like a, another dad, if you like. And he's kind of always taught me not just about stuff during training, but outside of training, you know, when you're doing your weight cuts, you know, just talking to the UFC, talking to people, how to deal with sponsors, you know, things like that. Um, so he's been great, great in supporting me, you know, outside of the cage as well. Um, and I'm luckily enough to have a couple of friends that have supported me. And, you know, I have got the friends that are like, yeah, go get a job, mate. You're never going to make it. And I do have, I would say, two friends who are like, every step of the way, you know, they were like, you're going to make Always it. Always there. Yeah. You know, Always when there. When I say I'm going to be UFC champion, they say, yes, you are. Yes. Um, so I'm very fortunate because a lot of people don't have, deep down, you know, when your friends are like, they're, they're thinking this guy's crazy. Have you ever had to like drop friends yeah because of yeah, jealousy yeah, yeah 100 percent. i've never kind of actually gone up to a friend and said i no longer want to be your friend because i can just sense this kind of jealousy but i have taken step distance backs. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's sad because you know if i said to you if i had a party i could probably have 200 people turn up but how many are actually going to be there for you not many who's going to help you tidy up yes that's, that's exactly those are that. the real friends exactly who's going to help you yeah. set up not just turn up and just have a party yeah Do you know what i mean and then just leave exactly you so, know that the real friends are are the ones that help you yeah and unfortunately there's not there's not that many but you know i guess that's what makes them so special right because you don't find many like that you know yeah it's better to not have a crowd honestly it's, exactly. it's too much to deal with anyway yeah yeah <laughs> it's a lot to deal with what about fans How's, how's like, your fandom, um, I guess, starting out, starts off small, mm -hmm. and then as you go into UFC and do bigger fights, it grows. How's that been for you? So it's been nice. You know, I've only ever had, touch wood, good experiences. You know, I've never had any kind of real sort of haters, if you like, and, you know, no one's ever said anything bad to me on the streets. Everyone's always been pretty supportive, you know. The best ones is like, you know, I'm going on a jog and someone says, oh, hey, go on, champ, good luck on your next fight. Or, you know, just them sort of ones. I love it. Um, you do get the kind of drunk ones sometimes, which can be a bit of a handful because, you know, I'm dead sober. Maybe I've just come from a fight and, you know, I've got some drunk guys spitting all over me, telling me he loves me. And it's like, <laughs> mate, I appreciate the support. That's the last thing you want right but, now. <laughs> yeah, get off me, you know. Um, but yeah, no, I think MMA fans are the best in the world. You know, they really do. Well, the ones that I've got are really supportive, you know. Um, when I've had losses, you get the messages, you know, chin up, come on, you know, get back on the horse and get back in it. But then I guess, you know, my, would they do the same for other fighters? I don't know. But, you know, I like, to think, big... I like to think they're my fan. Yeah, they're you know? your fan because they're so, supporting you. They're showing yeah, you love. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm very thankful for the sort of fan base that I do have. Um so, yeah, and I've got a, a clothing brand. And, you know, when I have do you? people buying my stuff that I don't know the guy personally. You know, if I see my mom and dad buying a T-shirt, I'm like, cheers, mom, cheers, dad. Thanks, That's not thanks, quite guys. the same. But when you see some guy from Australia or someone from America, I'm like, well, they're obviously a fan of me. And that's a special feeling. Amazing. I want to get some of your merch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to check it out. Is it, is it like merch or is it like a proper clothing line? So it's a... Uh, 
we're kind of aiming for the sports brand stuff. Okay. And we're actually now got an investor on board and we're kind of completely rebranding it. So the stuff we do have now, we're not ever going to restock again. Um, limited edition. Kind of limited edition. It's, yeah. It is limited because it's it limited. Yeah. Get it out. Yeah. Okay, and I want to uh, get it. Yeah, so that's the plan. And it's, I'm one of these people I can't sit still for more than five minutes. So obviously I do my training session in the morning and in the evening. In the day... I'm like itching to do something. So me and one of my friends started this clothing brand a few years ago and it was just kind of for a project, if you like, you right. know, to keep busy in between training sessions. And yeah, we're still going now. So mm, it's, it's doing all right. That's great. I'm going to get some for my partner. He's going to yeah. love it. Can't wait. We are going to move on to Commandment Free. So talking of haters, as we were talking about, um, as we were mentioning earlier, rise above. Every great thing was at one point new and different. Those who fear their own difference will want to point out yours. So if you want to be great, you're going to have to need to rise above. So how do you deal with critics? Um... I would say I take on board everything they say, if that makes everything, sense. Everything. What if, what if it's... Depends on that. What so, if it's, like, um, not even helpful? It's just... Well, if someone was to say, you know, hey, rude. you're ugly, I'd just put my thumb up and say, cheers, mate. You cheers. know, <laughs> crack on, whatever. But sometimes, you know, some of the critics, they do have, like, in regards to my sport, you know, if someone says, oh, um, you know, Naif keeps dropping his hand in that fight or he does this that's really bad or whatever, you know, I take that on board. Okay, I'll take that away and I'll actually, you know, do something about it. But yeah, if they're hater kind of critics who are just looking to offend you, oh man, I ignore them, you know. Yes. Just, I don't even give them the time or day, especially on social media and stuff. You know, if they oh see God. you reply, Keep oh, they're worries. all going to come in. And funny story, my coach, Brad Pickett, again, he had one guy that just kept on sending him DMs, right? And he was saying like, you know, just nasty things. Oh, my days. One day, my coach thought, like, you know, that's it. I'm going to message back. So he messaged back and said, mate, what's your problem? Like, <laughs> you know, what, what, what is it, your problem? Your sad little life. You're messaging me every single day. Like, what is it? And he went, I'm actually a big fan, mate. I just wanted to reply. Cheers. And he ended up having, like, a full-on conversation basically telling this guy, like, what's wrong with you? Do you know what I mean? You've been messaging me constantly. Oh, my God. And you're actually a fan. And he was saying, yeah, I just generally wanted to reply, mate. And, you know, I thought you might reply. And it's like... That's weird, you know. That's, that's, that's <laughs> really scary. Weird. So, <laughs> Very yeah. scary. If it's um, haters, kind of critics, don't entertain them whatsoever. Don't give them the time of day. Um, but if it's in regards to my sport and it's actually stuff that I can take on board, yeah, I'll take it, you know. Um, it's good to know the difference as well. Because yes. those, those critics or critiques or criticism, I should say, those criticisms regarding your sport can help you in the long run. Yes, and if, if you're you better, yeah, right. and if it makes you better, yeah. why not? And it's some people find it really hard to get feedback because yep. they take it personal straight away. They can be but, a bit arrogant with it. I know. Like, oh no, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. But how are you supposed to learn? How yeah. are you supposed to get better? If someone messaged you now, a friend or whoever, and they had some great advice on how you could make um, your podcast better, let's say, you could take that on board. And exactly. Say, okay, thanks for that. I, I appreciate it. Um, if you don't, that's, I guess, fine. But if you get offended by it, then... I know, it's just, it's not mature, is it? Yeah, I think it's no, very mature no. of you to differentiate the difference yeah. between criticism and just hate. Yes, 100%. Like, yeah, people are just... And that story, bloody hell, that's hilarious. It's creepy, right? Creepy and yeah, hilarious, because yeah. how? How? Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had one message me horrible stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like About really what? bad stuff. Just like when I've had fires and stuff, just saying like you're gonna get your your face smashed in. Or he's gonna put you in a hospital. Things like this, right? And then he's messaged me again. I've never in, I've never replied to him once. And then he sent me another one about probably about a year ago now, saying, "Mate, I'm really sorry for everything I used to say to you." Blah 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 blah. And cool. then I'm like, I'm just still not gonna reply to you. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. Because you've shown me the type of person you, you are. are. Yeah. Um, and imagine if that if I was someone that that really affected. You know, people like, sometimes are suicidal over this stuff. And I know. Know, like, obviously I, I'm not. Um, I just ignored him. But mm -hmm. yeah, now the guy wants me to reply with, uh, with a nice message. Like, ah, don't worry about it, mate. You know, it's, it's Yeah, it's late, cool. Man. It yeah. didn't affect my mental health. <laughs> and then what, let him in my DMs and then he can start abusing me or whatnot, you know. So 
yeah, I just just ignore them. Good. It's, it's the best way to deal yeah. with it. Do you find that? Let me let you finish. Because I want <laughs> Coca Cola in a mug. It, it looks like I've got loads of coffee. It really it. does. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. And when you have um, hot drinks in there, it's not it's not hot at all on the outside. Oh, right. Okay. I, I oh, just but then find boiling I, on the inside is it? It's boiling yeah. in the, and it makes it longer as well. Like yeah. it makes it last longer. Do you find that negative criticism provides motivation or inspiration for your training? Yes. So it definitely helps me get back on into the gym and work on things. You know, especially having my dad as a coach, he's always been a very he will point out more on the negatives. You know, he's right. always kind of said, I'm not here to just blow smoke up your ass because you're not going to get better. I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong and then we'll go from there. But then he does know when to give me that little, you're doing really well. Aww. You know, because sometimes you do need that. If someone just keeps, you know, putting you down, that can have that kind of detrimental effect where you just maybe give up. You know, some people might give up, but I use that as a way of getting back in the gym, getting better. Um, and I think every day he was just, better ourselves you know I'm always trying to do that whether it's in the gym whether it's starting a clothing brand or you know training my dog you know we just if every day we try and get better in yes. 10 years time you know it's gonna what would you advise someone that finds it hard to take on criticism especially maybe an athlete you know that's it they find it hard <sighs> to just know the difference or not take it Personal? Is it bad if I say drop the ego? Like, it's not bad because yeah, you're telling them just, straight. Just take it on. I guess if a random stranger just walked up to me and said, you need to hold your hands up in your next fight, you're dropping your hands too much, I might be a bit like, whoa, you know, take them back because this is just some random guy. But if a friend, like my friends, never blow smoke up my ass, you know, they tell me how it is and I love that, you know, because that's what your family and friends should do. Right. They should tell you what you do. You need to do to get better. They should tell you the negative. If I was coming across really arrogant, oh, my dad will tell me, you know, my mum my will tell me, my dad will tell me, he'll probably give me a slap around the ear <laughs> as well because that's what your family are there for. Yeah. You know, the people that just kind of ah, let him do what he wants, they don't care about you. Exactly. So, yeah, drop the ego and take it as a, as a good thing, I think. Exactly. Talking of ego, mm -hmm. there's a lot of trash talk within the MMA scene. Do you get involved in that? Or is it is it an act sometimes? Give I've me the tea. I've I never got involved with it. Have you except not? Except for my last opponent, we're having constant back and forth right now. So a lot of people, if you see me and he's back and forth, you'll think, yeah, Nath loves it. But I've never done it until then, if that makes sense. And that was because we've got a genuine kind of bit of beef now. Whereas before, I'm like, I'm not going to fake it. So right. I've never been that kind of pantomime, yeah, let's pretend that we hate each other. And I'm no good at it, you know, it's just cringy. I'll just, you get found out pretty quick if you're faking it. You know, I'm not Conor McGregor who can just, you know, fire everything off his tongue straight know how, away. I don't know how he has the energy. Yeah, I can't do that. I can't put on this act. So what you see is what you get. And if I'm having trash talk with someone, it's kind of a genuine, all right, let's, let's go. Um... But then that's the great thing about the sport, you know, in the end we have to fight, so you kind of got to put your money where your mouth is. Yes, I hear that, because that trash talking sometimes is, sometimes I'm like, I'm, I can take this personal, because it's a lot, the yeah. way they trash talk each other and the way they're about to beef each other sometimes. Yeah. God, I'm, yeah, I feel the energy between yeah. sometimes opponents it sometimes. Sometimes it's distasteful, you know, some yeah. people are very kind of sleazy with it. Very. Um, but yeah, luckily I've never had, I've almost had 30 fights and it's only this fight really where I've had a bit of back and forth. And compared to other guys, this is nothing, you know, this is not really anything special. But yeah, I just like fighting and, you know, shake hands before and after if you want. But if my opponent wants to kind of get in my face, you know, cool, I'll, I'll welcome it. But, you know, I've never actually had anyone kind of do that to me. Okay, let's move on to Commandment 4. Trust the journey, the path to your dream will at first seem so long, but if you learn to love the journey, you can never get tired. How did you initially break into UFC from MMA fights and what was that experience like for you? So when I first started, I literally just said to my dad one day, I want to be a 
UFC fighter. Yes. Obviously, UFC, at the time, there, there is more promotions now, but at the time, is the only sort of promotion where it's like, okay, I can make a living out of this. Um, so, yeah, I had to start on the regional scene, you know, local shows that were real sort of spitting sawdust, you know, just kind of real bottom shows. Um, win your fights and work your way up. Um, so I got to a promotion which was called Cage Warriors, which are pretty big now. You know, they're pretty big. And they had Conor McGregor, who was um, their champion. I then became the champion on that show. Defended yes. the belt twice. <laughs> and then got the call up from the UFC saying, do you want to make your debut in New York at the time? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's one of them promotions. Sorry, it's one of them sports. And this is what I love about it, where you're in control of your destiny, if that makes sense. You know, I guess if I compare it to like soccer or football, you, I guess you've got 11 players on a team. You right. know, you could have a really good day, but your team let you down. And then maybe the scout that's there doesn't get to see you perform. Or, you know, maybe vice versa. Maybe you're not that good and your team does really well. So you win, but you're not as good as you think you are. And with this sport, it literally is me versus another guy. Whoever wins, wins. You can't, fake it you right. know in boxing it's exactly the same thing but boxing can be a little bit more corrupt maybe in the sense where it's like you know you've got guys that are really really good fighting guys that aren't that good that you know maybe they've padded their record and stuff where mma and ufc is just you know if you beat this guy eventually you're going to get to where you want to be but you got to beat that guy and then the one after and then you might lose the fight so you go back down a couple of steps and you know you just know it's all in your control so yeah, regional scene. I think I had 20 fights around that, then got signed by the UFC. So it's been a long journey, but, oh you know, gosh. I've enjoyed everything. How long ago was that when, from your first ever fight till now? So it's been now... Let me do the maths. My first fight, I think, was when I was 17. And I'm almost 30, so wow. 13 years. Yeah, that was my first ever, like, semi-pro fight. Um, or maybe just turned 18. So, yeah, tw 12, 13 years. What a journey. Mm. And I'd like oh to think gosh. I've got a long way left, you know. I'm still... Can you remember, like, competing yeah, yeah. as a yeah. teenager? Yeah. And what if was I'm that honest, like? This was my thing about earlier where I said, like, you know, enjoy the moment. Because yes. back then I might be kind of, you know, I was always confident that I was going to make it. But you're stressing about money. What if I don't make it? What if this? And kind of ruin some of it. Because now that I know I've got to the UFC and I've been able to afford my place, etc. I wish I enjoyed it a bit more. Because, you know, I would go back there, 100%. You know, if you said, right, you can just reverse the clock and go back to when you was 16, you know, in a spit and sawdust gyms and trying to make it work, oh, I'd definitely do it. But at the time, all you're thinking about is I want to get older and make this and make that and not actually enjoying the moment and the present as much. So I think when you're younger, you're so clouded by what's going to happen in the yeah. future. You're not enjoying <clears throat> what's around you. And then everyone just wants to get younger again. You know, <laughs> yeah. They want to go back to their teens. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's just scary. It scares the hell out of me because I think, you know, from the time frame when I started, it's been 14 years and it's gone like that. In another 14 years, I'm like, I'm going to be almost 45 years old. And then I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to be 60 years. You know, so it's it's scary how quick it goes. But I think it's good that I realise that now. Because I think a lot of people realise it when it's too late. So, True. you know, I think if they're ever wanting to chase a dream or start a new career or start a podcast, do it now. You know, I think is, is now the is the it. best time because yeah. all we have is the present. Yeah. I talk about it in my book about enjoying the moment because we don't have the future yet. No, it's not here yet. And we can't do anything about the past because mm. it's gone. So I, I always try to hold on to the best moments. Yeah. And. Like what? What has been the best moment for you in your career? So my best moment was actually one of the UFC weigh-ins, and this right. was in London. Now the reason is is because after every fight, everyone cheers. You know, if you win, everyone cheers. They don't even know necessarily who they're cheering. They're just they're just cheering. At the UFC weigh-ins, it's where me and my opponent come face to face the day before the fight, and we have a face-off. And it was in London, my hometown, and the crowd were going crazy for me which was an unreal feeling because it was like, we're not even fighting and this lot are here for me. Do you know what I mean? Um, so then that for me was the best moment, 100%, because it was like, this is real. You know, I can hear the, the kind of the roar that the crowd had. Whereas when you're in your fight and you've just finished and the adrenaline rush is going, you don't really notice it. 
But then right. at the weigh-ins, I was like... You were yeah, absorbing the moment. Yeah, I was gas. like, let's go, let's go. And I see everyone with the flags. And, you know, that was a pretty special moment for me. Um, and then I did win that fight as well. So. Yes, I think that gave you the confidence oh, yeah. there, as well. It wasn't just me in that cage. I had the whole, the yes. whole arena as far as I was concerned. That's so good. I think people's support and energy can really lift up your own energy. Yeah, 100%. As we spoke about before, like your parents, your family, your supporters, they're the ones that push you to be yeah. the best that you can be. Um, I think that's such an important thing to remember, to to cherish the ones that really push you, not like not believe <clears throat> not not believe what they say. Yeah. That a lot of people tend to just throw throw away those advice and yeah. um their their family support away but mm. cherish it man. I put a tweet out the other day and I said uh it was something like if your friend tells you their dreams or explains to you their dream, never tell them to be realistic. You know, it's ask the worst. them how are you gonna get there? Exactly. And make it actually achievable. Because and help them yeah, to get there. I can't remember the saying, but it's like if a dream's wrote down on paper, it becomes a plan. And yes. if you execute the plan, it becomes realistic or whatever. But you know, why not? You know, That's if my why friends, I like to if do If my this. friends say to me, oh, I want to, I don't know, be a millionaire. So go on in. Yeah. Why not? Why not? I'm I'm the same. I think a lot of people just, oh, it's not good to put people down or no. say be realistic. Even if... You might doubt them. Mm. Mate, you might think it. But it's only because they don't want you to overtake them. True. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I've got a few friends that have mortgages. So when I got mine, they were so happy for me. And then I've noticed that sometimes the friends that are still at their mum and dad's or haven't got a mortgage, which isn't a problem, or they're renting, when I tell them, oh, I just got my mortgage, it's a bit like, mm, did you? You know, they're, you're like, whoa, you're not happy for me. I wasn't rubbing it in their face, you know. I didn't go, guess what? You it's know. something you did. But yeah, <laughs> so. you kind of feel a bit like, oh man, you're not, you're not really happy for me. Whereas, you know, if my friends tomorrow were telling me that they, I don't know, just won a hundred mil on the lottery, I'll be like, yes, I'm yes. buzzing for you. <laughs> not, huh, you're going to give me some, you know what I mean? Well, just, how are you going to do that? Yeah, like, I, I love seeing people. In a sarcastic way. I love seeing people achieve things. I know? love people, I love seeing people win. Yeah. I, for me, it's natural, but for other people, mm. it's unnatural to to like people winning because it's surpassing them. Yeah. Or but like what are they doing? Or... But what are they doing? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're putting the work in, you know, how can you be envious or not, it's like, you know, feel it's... good for that person? Yeah. You know, if they're grafting away, like, clap for them. Insane. You know clap I mean? for them, honestly. We are going to move on to Commandment 5. Only doubt, doubt itself. The words I can't only become true if you don't. When and why have you doubted yourself? And what did those, and what did you do to overcome those doubts? Hmm. That's a good question. Maybe especially leading up to a fight. So when I fight, it's a very kind of mixed emotions. You get the doubt sink in and then you kind of get rid of it. And then yes. you get, it comes back in and it's up and it's like a roller coaster. But how do you get rid of them? <sighs> to get rid of, I don't think I get rid of it. I think I just crack on. And then when I've had a fight, let's say, and I'm doubting it and I'm thinking, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose. That little thought that says you're going to lose. And then you're kind of battling with the one that says you're going to win. It's like, well, I don't have a choice now. I'm, I'm in too deep. And then when I come out and I win, I know that that thought that said, that doubt, it's not real. It's yes. your anxiety. It's your whatever so i just know now that you just kind of got to ignore it do i, you know I mean? and just completely agree. do it anyway so do it anyway yeah if someone if you if you're in doubt let's say podcast let's say you're thinking i'm gonna start a podcast and oh, is it gonna work i'm not sure you know is it gonna be successful i'm not sure just do it anyway exactly and if it's not then it's not and you'll deal with it when it comes so for me what does it mean to for it to work when people say does it is it gonna work you have to make it work. <laughs> but I guess as well, it's it's what do you deem successful, right? right. So, uh, you know, to me, if I won a million pounds tomorrow, that would be absolutely life-changing money. But if the richest man in the world won a million pounds, it would be nothing to him. Yes. So everyone has their different kind of, you know, a million followers on, in, on Insta TikTok for me would be like, oh my gosh, you've got three million. 
So if all of a sudden you woke up tomorrow and you've got a million, you'd be like, why have I just lost two million followers? Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? It's true. Um, so yeah, I kind of went off on that, sorry. No, um, so it was a good tangent. It was so a very yeah, good one. I think one. you kind of got to think about what it is to you. Right. And I think going back to doubting yourself, a lot of people <laughs> listen to that voice and they think it's yeah. real. And I've had to literally learn and teach myself that that voice that doubts mm. that doubts all of me, um, she needs to <laughs> go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I have I've had to practice positive self talk, and I th- I feel like you do the same when you're telling yourself mm-hmm. you can, because mm. who else is going to? No one else is going to yeah. tell you your well, obviously your friends and family, but your your inner dialogue. Mm-hmm. No one hears what you actually say to yourself. So speaking to that and saying, no, actually, I'm going to do it. I'm going to win. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be successful. It's so important. Some Mm. people literally don't don't know how to do that. They just (laughs) listen to that negative Yeah, just ignore it. Just ignore it. And as well, losing is always an option. So, of course, yeah, you might have doubts saying I'm going to lose my fight. But, yeah, you could lose. But then... You're still alive. You're going to come home. you still got your family. you still got your friends. You know, it's not life or death situation. Um, so just ignore doubt. And I think it's normal. I think now, if I have a fight and I'm not nervous, I'll be like, hmm, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> yeah, because them nerves is what keeps you firing. You know, it's what gets you um, sharp in, in the cage. So, you know, I think it's important to have doubt. I think it keeps you on edge. So and... important. Have you ever had doubts within a fight? And how did you overcome uh, yes, that? Yes, I've had it where, okay, you're down to, there's three rounds in MMA. I've had it where it's like, okay, you're down two rounds. You're down two rounds. You need to win this fight. You need to win this fight. And, you know, I, I lost the fight because I got too hasty and I kind of right. let that doubt mess me up. But I lost the first two rounds. So you didn't have a choice. That doubt was there saying, okay, if you don't do something, you're going to lose this fight. So it was, if anything, trying to help me. I lost the fight and, you know. But you haven't lost many. You you yeah, learn most of the time. You move on. Do you know what I mean? Like someone said to me, "How do you deal with it now?" And before, I'd be crying my eyes out. Whereas now, I'm like, "Well, I'm still alive. I still got my health. There's kids out there dying with illnesses that you know, and wishing they could give life another shot. Why would I be so? Do you <laughs> I know, know. I mean? Just get on with it. It's gonna like... win at the next one. And I'm sure you think that mm. now. I'm gonna win at the next yeah, one. Yeah, you can't win them all, right? Exactly. Have you ever had injuries that have made you? Doubt yourself. Uh, I've had quite a lot of injuries. Yes, um, the last couple of years has been really bad as well. I was actually out for two years, um, oh then God. came back, and then for my last fight, four weeks out, I split my knee open. I like completely had fourteen stitches. How in did it. you do that? So imagine like this table here. It's there was like a wooden edge going around the mats. Now the mats are supposed to be on on top of it. Now part of the mat must have like slipped just under, and I've landed and sliced my leg open completely. Like, I could mm-hmm. see everything. And funny enough, it didn't actually really hurt, but I was just devastated. I was like, that's it. You know, my, my career's over I think it was the again. adrenaline that yeah. made it not uh, hurt. So I had to pull out of the fight, unfortunately. And it was one of those things where I was just like, I'm done with this, man. This is because constant back-to-back injuries, you know, is this my body saying, it's done, you know. The next day, I'm like, nope. We're going to go back from it. You know, we're going to work from it. And I just try and think everything's God's plan now. So yes. everything happens for a reason. Um, and that's the kind of best way I think I had to look at it. Um, just to keep on a positive and get back in there, get back in the gym the next day. And this was only a f- couple of months ago and I'm back in the gym now. And, you know, I'm looking to get another fight booked. And, you know, you just got to crack on. It's so great. You have such a positive mindset. It's taken a while. It's taken a while to get that. You know, it's, yeah. I think it's growing up. You know, I didn't have a positive mindset necessarily when I was younger. Um, I always did in regards to MMA, but I can be very negative with things. Mm-hmm. But I think it's my parents. You know, I think any times I was very negative and I remember failing my driving test three times and then passing and every time I'd fail, my parents like, get Go in Get in the because you yes. ain't going to get it if you don't. So you just kind of just got to live with, right, get back on a horse and go again, innit? you? I love your parents. I haven't even met them, but I love they're them. They're golden. <laughs> they're golden, honestly. Oh, they, are, they, are they sound parents. like they're the best. Yeah. Like, I love such loving parents, a loving family, because you see that reflected into the <clears throat> children. Yeah. You yeah, really yeah. do. When you see, when, <clears throat> when someone's, or when someone's in a toxic family, you can kind of see their toxic traits. Yes, yeah. But if they're in a loving 
hopeful, kind family. You can see that in someone. So yeah, 100%. That's good. Moving on to commandment six. Discover new perspectives. If you have the chance to see the world, then do. You will see yourself differently when you discover new perspectives. How has traveling to different countries influenced your perspective on fighting and training? Um, or has it? I wouldn't say it's changed anything in regards to my training, but traveling has made me realize how spoiled I am and how spoiled we are in a country. What what countries have made you feel When like I went that? to Egypt and I saw like the kids that had nothing, you know, that was like and at the time, I, this was before I was training, I was 14 or 15, I think. And I was like, oh, shit, like, we're spoiled. Do you know what I mean? This is how other people are living. Like, And this was before kind of like social media. I was on that and stuff. Um, so you don't really see that. And I was like, oh, man, we're spoiled. You know, just to have running tap water, you know, clean that you can drink. And, you know, these kids, I think we was on quad bikes. And as we stopped at these lights, these kids ran out to try and sell bracelets for like a penny or whatever it was. And you could just see like they had no trainers on and it was all like, the, the floor was like, um, like, they needed trainers on, do you know yeah. what I mean? And they had like barely any clothes on them and it was just like, oh man, you know, I feel really shitty now that I'm sitting on this quad bike with my brand new trainers and sunglasses and whatever I had at the time. Um, it puts everything into perspective, to be yeah, honest with you, because yeah. you're like, wow, thank God yeah. I was born in the UK. Yeah. You know, now, as much as we complain how bad it is. Oh, like, but When you see people complaining now, I think, what are you complaining for? I know. And you go to Thailand. Now, Thailand, I think, is the best country on earth. Right? Is it? Now, I've been there quite a few times. And the people, you sort of go there and you think, oh, this guy's like in poverty. And you see, and I, I kind of watched them, right? I watched this kid on the beach and he was hustling everyone all day. He was playing noughts and crosses in the sand and he would win every single time. And he would have money off me every two seconds. But he was a, like just a nice, happy kid. And you just look at them and you think, oh, we're the poor ones. Because they're all smiling. They're all happy. They've got nowhere else to be. They're happy just working. You know, I saw some guys that were, their job was that they take you out on the, the boats, like these little sort of canoe boats or whatever with an engine and they just take you around all day and that was it and they look like the happiest blokes in the world they were just laughing together minding their own business you know someone would bib someone on the road and they're just like yeah you know <laughs> there's no kind of road rage and i'm just like oh these guys are living in the moment like that they've got no tops on nice weather shorts some little sandals no one cares about what they're wearing and i'm like man this is the life this is the life this is the life do you know what i mean and then you come back here and it's like okay what clothes you got on and you do kind of fall into that trap right you're trying to keep up with everyone um so yeah well, the, would... over there it's it's for me I, i'm from sierra leone and it's mm -hmm. in west africa mm -hmm. so i went there twice last year the first time i came back i was after eight years so i went there as a child i, I no when i was eight not eight years ago, when I was eight, that's the last time I went there. Yeah. So when oh, it was, it was very surreal because it was like, wow, this is how people live. Mm. This is how the other half live, and it's it's quite heartbreaking as well. Um, interesting story that happened to me when I came out of a restaurant. There was a group of uh, disabled people. There, there was. Um, a few in wheelchairs and some in crutches, mm -hmm. right? And <clears throat> what they, they they basically was begging, right? Because there's not much people, there's not much for disabled people in places in Africa, if I'm being honest. And they were begging and I was tired of people begging me all day. Didn't I said, no, I no, I don't want to give you money. And then he screamed to me um, when I was going down the road, but we're the same. And I was like, oh. Mm. It's true. Imagine if I was born in Sierra Leone, I'd be begging. Because mm. what job would I have? Who would employ me? You know, I'm lucky to be brought up in the UK and have mm. opportunities. So I turned back, gave them like a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand's like ten pounds, and it just really changed my yeah. perspective because it was like, wow, what if I was actually mm. born there? You know, it's just 
yeah, th- those people are more. In, it, they still had a smile on their face whilst begging, but that's their only way to live. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so I think I think other countries have taught me. You know, you don't need a lot to be happy. You really don't, and it's also taught me that we're really spoiled, and that you should be grateful for the little things like water. Do you know what I mean? I've got I water comes out the tap. Got a roof over my head. You know, come on, I know. man. You know, life's uh, yeah. You life. see so many kids now, and they're hard done by that. I ain't got PS Five. You know, I'm crying their eyes out. Oh, I want my, my iPad, and I, but I can't wait to have kids so that I can teach you know, them. G- yeah, get the right the right things taught to them because I think we're kind of lost now. So well, lost. Society. There's, do you know what? Back in the day, I feel like we were more happier. Yeah, hundred percent. Back in the day, when there wasn't much technology, and we yeah. actually played out with our friends, knock on the door, Are knock you on the door. <laughs> yes, I'm coming out. There was no texting. It was like yeah. I'm knocking for this person. Yeah. I see if they're in. You know, we were much more happier back in the day. But Even now, when, it's... when I was at, I think 16, we st- I just got Call of Duty, and it was online. And this was like the first time I was sort of like introduced to online. And I remember then thinking, I kind of miss the days when it was split screen and my friends would come over. Oh, yeah. and you know, like Mario Kart and you've got four of you and you're all you're all together interacting. And now you don't even talk to him. You know, I see my nephew and he's like just zoned in on the computer and he's talking to his mates. But I'm like, that's not... It's not the same. It's not the same. You know, it's not socialising where you had your mates next to each other. And, you know, I'd try and cover my mate's eyes so I could beat <laughs> him in the race or whatnot. And yeah, I, I think it's sad. And I wish I kind of grew up in the 80s. Because when my parents tell me about it, I'm just like... Sounds hey, like fun. You lot had the best years. Yeah. Best years ever. Now I think it's all getting a bit too virtual reality and everyone's on the phones and... I know. It's like you're not... It's like living a lie, if you like. There's no kind of community. You know, even now, around sort of my way, I'm like, there aren't really any sort of like pubs or social clubs where people actually go there and they know everyone, you know? Um, it's not there's no real sense of community <clears throat> nowadays no I think everyone's out for themselves and their couple of their friends and family and that's it if you're not in our circle you know if there was an, a car accident I saw the other day and everyone's on their phone and no one's actually thinking is the person alright do you know what I mean people were on their phones yeah, filming yeah, it yeah yeah. oh my god yeah, an old lady bless her she passed away my friend was telling me he's right outside his house a big Selco um, like they had the crane on it I don't know what you call it but it's like a really big truck. He's run over an old lady, not realised, right? He's crushed her legs, not realised, drove off. And apparently he's genuine. They've, he's been caught and they've said, wow. look, it was a mistake. Um, I don't know how she's got caught in it, but my friend was first on the scene. Her legs were crushed, but she was with it. She went to hospital and died. But when she, he was there, they called the other neighbour who was her like next of kin. Wasn't right. a family member, but lived with her or something. And he's filming it and going, this is a claim, this is a claim. And it's like... Bro, put your phone away and let's get her sorted. Yeah. And yeah, she died. So, you know, don't this know what he's going to do this with that the video. We live claim, in. But yeah, he was more interested in that than actually helping the situ- her and the situation. So, sad, yeah. isn't it? It's very sad. Wow. God. <laughs> so yeah. Bad. Oh, yeah, that's the world we live in. It's just insane. And I think back in the day, everyone would be there together. Yeah. You know, as human beings, let's all support each other. Whereas now it's like, you know, you don't live on Mice Road, I've got nothing to do with you, or you're not from this country, or whatever. People are just so against. Everyone's in circles. Do you know, know what I mean? If you're not from that person's area, okay, you've got an issue. If you're not from the same country, they've got issues. Street parties. Let's have st- street parties. I miss them. Yeah, like, you know, barbecues together, or... I don't know, it's just so... Where is it? Even now, like, when I went to America before, everyone was walking past each other saying, like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like... I don't, know, I don't know you. Do you know what I mean? Why are you saying Because if, if you go down the road now and someone just randomly says hello, you always think a bit... And it? It's oh, like, you're, it's you're nice. a bit sketched. Like, because I, when I walk the dog, the dog owners, it's always very sort of, morning, you're all right, and it's nice, but it's like, why aren't we all just doing that? You know, I know, and I, I do love that about America. Yeah. That everyone is very chatty. Mm. So chatty. It got to the point where I was chatted out, honestly. At, yeah. at one point, I was I was like, I'm tired of talking to people yeah, in the morning because yeah. this yeah, is not what I'm used to. <laughs> like, how are you doing? How's your day? Yeah. I'm like, why are you so interested in me? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> why? yeah. And because the first one that asked me, I was like, well, what are you up to? You know? I know. Like, what do you want? <laughs> and then I realised, oh, I'm the one that's in the wrong here. This guy's just being nice. And then I'd notice, you know, everyone in the hotel, morning, how you doing? You're right. And... Yes, yeah. they're just all like that. Yeah. A real sense of community. Yeah, yeah. So 
So we are going to move on to commandment seven. Stop. When your dreams come true, it can happen so fast that you hardly notice. Stop and take a look around because it's happening right now. So that's the quote. I do love that quote because it's like, stop, I'm looking. When did you first realise you were making moves in the world of MMA? So I'll go back to that bonus moment. And oh, yes. The, but I can literally describe it, right? I'm in my hotel room. I've had my fight and I've got bad concussion. So after the fight, I was okay. Two hours later, I was bad. They rushed me to hospital. Was it through um, them? Like, yeah, yeah. The so in the fight, I got punched quite bad. And, you know, was, I won the fight, but I was rocked in the fight, you know. So a couple hours later, I've got really bad concussion. So anyway, I've gone back to the hotel at this point. I think it's like 12 o'clock at night. And you don't know who's got the bonus until late in the night because they wait for all the fights to go and then they decide who has the bonus. And I'm in bed and I'm I'm naked, but I've got my T-shirt on. I've been sick loads of times. My face is all smashed. You know, my, my eye had completely shut up. Like, I got beaten up quite a bit. Oh, my gosh. Um, I'm not good at being sick. So where I was really sick, that kind of made my eye swell up even more. Half of my head was killing me and I was in a bad way. So anyway, my dad's up. He's just sort of on the little sofa thing that was in our room watching the highlights of the UFC. And at this point, obviously, I've kind of forgotten about the whole bonus thing and didn't really think about it. And I'm there in bed, just like, you know, painful. And he's come up and said, uh, Nathaniel Wood, $50,000 bonus performance of the night winner. And I remember just being like, yes, yes. And then I was like, oh, my head. Ow. But uh, I was cheering and then also in agony. But it was, that for me was that stop, like, I can see myself on the screen. It's got my little my little face and three other fighters that got bonuses as well. And I was like, that's me. And it's got $50,000 row right next to me. And that's a moment where, even though it was really painful at the time, you know, that's a stop. Like, yes. you know, feel this moment. And yeah, so seeing me on that screen, you know, it was just the kind of... Did you celebrate that moment or did you just get back into the grind? So... Right that second, I was like trying to celebrate my dad. My dad was like, yes. And I'm like, oh, dad, my head. But, yeah. you know, it was like, it was bittersweet. You had to recover as yeah, well. How can you yeah, get back yeah, into yeah. the grind? Yeah, it was, it was hard. But the next morning, obviously, he was flying back. I had my face was all smashed up. And the concussion had kind of faded. Like the pain of it, the, the headache. And that was like a, you know, yes. breathe it all in, mate. Breathe it all in. But, um, yeah, as soon as I got home, it was like, right, when's the next fight? You know, get another one. And, you know, that's the thing. We never really actually stop and... Look around. You know, yeah, enjoy, enjoy the stuff. moment, yeah. celebrate, have a drink or two and just really enjoy the moment, like yeah. celebrate your achievements. Yeah. I don't think we do that anymore. We just no. post it on Instagram and move yeah. on, you yeah. know. And you want the next best thing, right? Yeah. How you sp I don't know. It's just so on to the next, mm. basically. And sometimes I feel like back in the day, like going back to back in the day, if something like that happened, you're celebrating it for, you're talking about it for weeks. Yeah. You know, you're talking about it for so long. Because <laughs> with Instagram and TikTok, it's, it's always on to the next thing. Yeah. We're looking at so many posts a day, feeding in so much information, you just forget what yeah. your achievements are, mm -hmm. you know. So I, that's why I like to look back at my pictures and yeah. remember what see who I used to. Yeah, see how far I've come. And I think everyone should do that. Honestly, because yeah. then I'm like, wow, that that Fatima would have never thought she'd be here today at all. So would your younger self ever think you would be here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I, was, never, I was never in doubt. I was manifested always, it. Yeah. I was always like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to get here. And even now I'm like, I've got so much more that I want to do and achieve. But I just think it's important that you enjoy the process as well. Do you know what I mean? Because right. I'm like, okay, when I started, I'm like, I want to make millions of pounds in fighting. I haven't done that yet. So it's like, oh, you could be like, you're not happy. No, I am very happy where I am now. And now I realise that, you know, I'd do anything to go back to when I was 18. I'm like, no, enjoy this moment. Yes. And the million pounds and stuff will come. And then when that comes, there's something else is going to come. So just enjoy every step of the way, right? So, exactly. Enjoy it every step of the mm. way because you can't, you can't just forget it you yeah. can't just forget about the moments that you have achieved you know mm -hmm. so what advice would you offer someone if they're just starting out in the sport and looking to follow your footsteps um it would be that that just enjoy the moment so 
if you're trying to make ends meet in MMA, which you will be, because it's a sport where you kind of need to go full time and there's no money in it to go full time. So you kind of got to make that sacrifice. Enjoy it because, you know, I wish, well, I did enjoy it, but I wish I enjoyed it more and stress less. Yes. But then again, that stress kind of keeps you in the gym. So, you know, just enjoy it and just take every day and let it kind of just play out. Yeah, My mum always used day. to say to me, everything play out. You know, I'll have a fight cancelled or whatever and the day before and I'm like to my mum, no, you know, um, the world's ending. And my mum's like, no, everything will play out. And it does. It you know, really everything does. Everything kind of falls into place and I think you just got to enjoy the moment and just know that everything will work out if you put the work in. Yes. Because obviously I think some people think, oh, if I'm just lazy and just manifest it and that's all I've got to do. But no, you have got to work for it. But enjoy it. Enjoy that grind. Enjoy the grind. God doesn't help those that don't help themselves. Yeah. So, yes. And I think all the, the successful people that I've read about always say that that was the best time, the grind. Whereas when they make it, it's like, uh, you know, let's go back to the... Yeah, because it's the, the feeling of hunger yeah. and being driven is there. But when you've got it all, it's like, yeah. uh, there's nothing... I've done everything yeah. now. <laughs> I always think, imagine being born rich, like as in son of a billionaire. You would never have any appreciation for anything and you would never actually enjoy anything. If you've been brought up in Ferraris and Lamborghinis, when you get a Ferrari or Lamborghini, it's like, eh. I always think that as well because I'm glad to work for what I do because mm. I feel more proud of what I get yep. and mm. how I've achieved things. Um, for example, <laughs> I don't want to put anyone on blast, but 50 Cent's son, I don't know if you've heard about him, but... Basically, 50 Cent doesn't talk to his son anymore because he's never satisfied with the allowance as a grown man that he I gives him. Yeah, 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 them two have beef. And I think to myself, wow, I'm so lucky. like 100 grand a month. I yeah, think. and he's like, oh, yeah. my dad should be paying me more. Da, da, da. And 50 Cent's like, no, I want, like, I've spoiled my son. I made a mistake by giving him yeah. money every month. And now he feels like he's entitled mm -hmm. to money. So going back to achieving it through hard work, you feel more gratitude towards mm -hmm. yourself and you feel like you can work more. Yeah. Those that just get whatever they want, it's just, it's I'd so unfulfilling. Yeah. <clears throat> so unfulfilling. Yeah. I would hate that. I would hate that as well. Mm -mm. Not for me. Next we have Commandment 8. which is love you. Learn to love yourself and then someone else. Have you ever experienced love? Question is, do you love yourself? Would you say you do? I'm probably bad at that. I probably am. You know, I've always... It's like a prime example the other day. I treated myself to something and I felt really guilty about it. But I would never feel guilty if I buy someone else something. Right. Because I just don't know. I always feel like... I don't, know, I don't deserve it, but I do. But I don't. Do you know what I mean? It's you so do weird. Deserve it, I hate talking. If someone says to me, "Oh no, if you're a really good fighter," I'm like, "Oh, I'm, I'm all right." You know, I don't like compliments. I wouldn't say I love myself. Oh, it's, it's weird. That's a tough question. I try and be like that now. I try and be like, "No, I'm proud Embrace of myself. It. I'm a good person. I am." Yeah. And then it's hard to actually feel like that sometimes. Have you f found it hard to? love yourself through the ups and downs in your professional MMA yeah. career. Yeah, I'd say so. Why it's, is that? I don't know. And if you if I if I took myself out of my body right, <laughs> and I went over to someone else and had to talk about myself, I'd have loads to say. Oh he's a good guy, he's done this, he's done that. <laughs> but actually feeling what? that sense of love or, or about myself I don't necessarily. I always put myself down. But then I have to kind of fight myself to build myself. It's such a hard question and it's hard to explain. Um, but I can be very negative on myself. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you're critical of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah Sometimes because yeah. you, you're always looking to be the best you can be. But yeah. what about you now? Yeah, well, I always might think I'm not good enough or I've not done enough or... And then I might feel guilty if I kind of remind myself, no, you've done this that's really good. And I think, oh, now I'm being arrogant. 
It's hard. No. It's such a hard question. Yeah. No, but, you can't. I, I don't think for me, there's real arrogance where you're like, I'm better than everyone else. Mm. But if you can say to yourself, oh, I'm, I'm the shiz. Let me not swear. But yeah, the shiz is like, I don't think that's arrogance. Mm. I think that's loving yourself, being proud yeah. of yourself. I and, think there's, I'm, I'm proud of stuff when it comes to like my sport. Um, but then it's hard to feel proud sometimes if that makes sense so right. if you said to me are you proud of what you've done yeah i'm proud I've, I've achieved a lot of stuff but do i feel that sense of pride kind of thing i'm like no sometimes i have to try and say to myself come on Nath, you know pick yourself up I think, I think you should you should be like mm. you should love yourself kind of comes and goes right comes so and sometimes goes. i sort of love myself and then sometimes I'm like, oh, i put myself down and then you're in a bit of a dump and you gotta pick yourself up and I think that's just that mental health side of things, you know. It's, it's a tricky one. So. It is, it is. But I'm better at anyone else. Oh, I'm great for people sometimes, <laughs> you know. I can really big people up. And You're the hype man yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Everyone needs a hype man and you yeah. you got to be your own hype man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you do. So what? Um, my next question is, what is the difference between confidence, arrogance and self-respect to you? Um... So confidence, everyone should have it. Yes. And I think, it's how, how do I word that? So the difference between confidence and arrogance, and what was the other one you said? Um, self-respect. Self-respect. So arrogance, I think, can come when you may be comparing yourself. You're almost putting other people down. Yes. To build just your confidence. So it's like, oh, I'm confident, but I'm better than you at that. That's why I'm confident. Whereas confidence should just be about you it should competing come from against within. yourself. Yeah. yeah. So let's say I do my 5K on a run, on a treadmill. And let's say my, my record's 19 minutes and I get 18 minutes the week later. I'm, I'm confident. I'm, yes, you know, I'm, I'm confident that I'm going to win this fight. Why? Oh, because I've hit my record. I've achieved something. But if I was to sort of say, I'm confident, why? Because... I done it in 19 minutes and he done it in 1920. It's like kind of arrogance yes. where you're competing against someone because then someone else could come up to me and say, "Well, I done it in this." So I think that the confidence should just be about yourself. Exactly. Because every day you're competing with yourself, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's it's such a hard one to explain because I'm like, tricky, how can I explain this question, in words? Yeah, I don't know if I have the vocabulary to to kind of explain it. Um, no, but I think you explained it right. Yeah. It's all about your perspective you know I think for me personally because I'm dyslexic and because um, I'm from London like East London I always worry I always worry about my accent I always worry about do I sound eloquent enough mm -hmm. but I am enough it's okay people are gonna relate to me from London and some people love my accent mm -hmm. it's cool it's fine <clears throat> so yeah and, and that's why I'm just speaking up for those that are underrepresented because I don't see many people mm. from my area doing what I do. So, no. And that brings us on to Commandment 9. Be heard. It is hard to thrive in a world that doesn't seem to respect people or listen to your perspective. It is even harder to make it a change. But just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not necessary. And just because they don't listen doesn't mean you won't be heard. Have you been fearless enough to speak up to make any sort of changes in your life? If I'm honest, with today's day, I'm usually like... I'm just going to stay quiet because really? I feel like the world's a bit lost. You know, when it comes to like social media, I go on there and I'm like, we've got no hope. Do you know what I mean? I go on Twitter and I'm like, what has the world come to? And I go to write, I put a tweet out, you know, I'm about to say my point. And then I'm like, I'm just going to delete it because it's like, I feel like. Your voice is not heard. Your or, voice is not heard. or you or feel we, like it we, won't make a difference. It won't make a difference. Yeah. So, yeah. But what if you do? You never know. Yeah, it's hard. Because if it's always that sort of thing that if everyone fall like that, it will make a difference. But I'm kind of like, you know, I'm just going to get on with my life, 
because I feel like sometimes if I go on there and worry about too much what's going on, like I never vote or do any of this sort of stuff. I have no, I don't watch the news. I have no idea. I don't keep up with politics. And my mum always says to me, well, you should, because you should have a say in what goes on in this country and stuff like that. But I think they're not going to listen to me. One vote doesn't make a difference. Yes, if everyone thought the way I did, it would make a difference. Yeah. But I think I put too much um, emotion into it and I'll get too upset and offended and I kind of just, just let it go, you know. I hear that completely. I'd rather just not get involved and go and live my little life on me. Has there any has there been any changes that you thought not changes, have you has there been any issues or things that have happened that you would want to speak up about within um, the MMA world? There are certain things. That, so even I've had one so right everyone like slates the UFC says we don't get paid enough, right? And I'm like I think I get paid like quite a good amount. So I came <laughs> out and said like Guys, I'm just going to, like, you know, speak on the UFC's behalf. Like, I think we get great money. I think if you compare us to footballers, footballers should not be getting paid what they're getting paid. You know, people were saying about Jake Paul getting paid, like, £10 million for a fight. You know, UFC fight. Who would need £10 million for a fight? It's ridiculous. You know, I don't think none of us need that money. So I just said, look, I think I get paid great. And I think, if anything, you know, the emergency services should get paid more. And, you know, that's how I would have it if I was the UFC, whatever, I'll be like, right, we're going to give some money to emergency services, right? And the, the amount of messages that I got saying, oh, he's only doing that for the UFC to give him more money and, you know, oh, he's just trying to do that for clout and I'm like, well, I can't win, can't you know what win. I mean? So I just, I deleted it in the end because I was like, I'm now getting kind of like, it's like a witch hunt against me because I'm trying to say something positive. Like, guys, I get to do what I love for a living and I get paid a decent amount for it a lot more than when I was on a building site. I'm I'm happy. I think if you explained it like with a following up mm. tw tweet like that, so that people can understand where you're coming yeah. from, because I think people probably just looked at the tweet and was like, "Oh, why is he like mm. just questioning it?" Someone if said to me, "Are oh, you gonna have brain damage and you're you haven't got insurance?" And I'm like, "Yeah, okay, I, I haven't got insurance, but I mean, like, my dad was." In a fire brigade, like that's more dangerous to me than MMA. Of course, there's injuries, and you, yes, touch wood, there are dangers involved in the sport, like in anything. You put your seatbelt on in a car, you're at risk going in that car. You get on a motorbike, you're at risk on a motorbike. And, you know, I tried to sort of put my little positive outlook, like, guys, can we just all like enjoy it? Because fighters were starting to get to the point where oh, I want more money, and it's like, man, let's just all be happy. You know, there's my positive <laughs> little thing. And then I'm getting hate for it. So I'm just like, right, I'm deleting that. And next time I'm not going to even make a comment. So it's sad. It is sad that that's how I kind of feel like I have to live. Um, don't get me wrong. I'll speak out with, in like my, my circle, let's call it, my friends, wow. my family, you know, if, that, if there's something that I want to say, I'll, I'll say it um, because I know that it will make a change and it will make a dif difference. And if I have to kind of, you know, give one of my friends a bit of a kick up the arse and say, look, mate, what you're doing is not, not right or yeah. then I will. But when it comes to like things that are going on in the world, I'm like... Believe I'm it. Stay out of it. Yeah, I hear it. Sad, I, isn't it? It's it's not sad. It's just I feel like it's just the social media world mm. we're in. How would you like to see the world of MMA improve for the next generation? Um, so it is becoming more well known now of le of a less of a barbaric sport. Um, because a lot of people now they will still kind of oh mixed martial arts, cage fighting, you know, they kind of, I think they'll assume that we're some thugs, you know, and it's far from that. You know, if you came to my gym, I think every person in my gym, I could say they haven't got a criminal record, you'd be like, what a lovely young man, you know, how polite they are. Are they really fighters? Because we're not thugs, we're not that kind of, I think people put us in a little box where it's like, oh, you know, they're, they're thugs, fighters, we don't drink, we don't smoke, you know, we're athletes. And I think that that's becoming more well-known now, and I'd like to just see that more often because um, I feel like some people kind of look down on us in a bad light. You when... want the stigma to go. Yes. And I think it will yeah. go through more oh, awareness. Yeah, and... I think more people are with us than against us. Yes, one. you did. And we are going to head on to the last commandment, commandment 10. Look back and then forwards, because both learning and dreaming are time well spent. 
What are your long-term goals in the UFC? What's next for you? So my long-term goals and dreams is obviously to be a UFC champion of the world. You know, that number one spot, the best on the planet. That is the kind of the, the end goal. That is the dream, of course. Um, I'm not there yet. I've got a few more fights to have. So, you know, my next step right now is to reach that top 10. Um, if I can get top 10 in the world and then a couple more fights, UFC champ. Yes. So, yeah, every uh, every day is just a step closer to the dream. So just keep training and keep enjoying it, you know, keep being happy. And at the moment, I love my job. I love MMA. I love everything about it. So the aim is to just keep that at the moment, keep that passion, keep that fire going, because obviously there's no point in being the champion of the world if I no longer enjoy the sport. So, yeah, just Keep living the dream. It's yes, the, uh, it's keep the living the dream. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, thank you so much for being a part of my podcast. I really appreciate it. And this is my first time ever interviewing an MMA fighter slash mm -hmm. UFC fighter. And I, I feel great. I feel great and uh, I, I hope you feel great and yeah. I, this is this is like almost like a therapy session. Yeah, no, I, I've it? enjoyed it. So thanks for having me. It's been, uh, Where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on all social medias as The Prospect MMA. That's my like fight nickname. Yes. So yeah, I'm on all of them. Uh, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram. Um, yeah, yeah, make sure so, you follow him. Yeah, no, please do. And follow his journey because it's a very interesting one. But yeah, thank you so much. No, and thank you. This is the end of the podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure you check out my book, Ten Commandments to Living Life Fearlessly. And see you on the next one. I never know how to end it. Yeah. <laughs> I just <laughs> see you on the next one. Yeah. I need to have like a signature thing, but mine was always just a little Yes. Because it's just every fight does it, you know, it's that. Punch. No, but if I imagine me doing it, I look hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who am I punching? Punching people's knees at this point. <laughs> Thanks for listening today. It's been fun. Remember to look out for my book, Main Character Energy, Ten Commandments to Live in Life Fearlessly. It will be available at all good bookstores. Now. <laughs>